Shalom and welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and this is our Midrash for Parasha Naso. So we're going to jump right into it. We've got a lot of material to cover this week. I'm going to have to refer a lot of, lot, refer to the website for a lot of stuff. We had a good question came, comes in. We get this sometimes. Uh, this is a paraphrase. Basically, should I vote in the upcoming elections and who should I vote for, Harris or Trump? These are questions that we get. And I'm just going to tell it to you straight. We are not in favor of democracy. Democracy is not a biblical means of governance. So let's take a quick review. We got the four main roles in Israel. We could say three main roles, and then there's a fourth. Now, the first of these is the kingship. Now, to qualify as a biblical kingship, the king has to be chosen by Yahweh. It's not optional. Same for the priest, same for the prophet. The prophet has to be telling you Yahweh's words, which are typically not pleasant. They don't speak to you with smooth things. And then you have the anointed judge who's a special combination of all three, typically because there's some kind of a rearrangement that needs going on. Kids don't try this at home. But here's what the house of Ephraim did, our forefathers, in Hoshea chapter 8 and verse 4. We set up kings, but not by him. Okay, we set them up by Asav. And then even after the breakaway, even after the Protestant Reformation, we made princes, but he didn't acknowledge them. Okay, he doesn't acknowledge prime ministers or presidents. That is of the Asavite model. So for those of you who've read the study on Nazarene Israel, we covered this a little bit, and then we covered it in more detail in Revelation in the End Times or Revelation Simplified on YouTube. So most of us are familiar with the sequence of five empires. It's number three in this list, starting with Babylon, then Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then you have the two, uh, the two legs of Rome. So one is Brother Ishmael with Islam. We talk about that in the Abraham Accords. So we talk about a little bit in Nazarene Israel. And also you have Protestantism and breakaway. So you have Ephraim coming back home. But this is all leading to, it talks about in the book of Revelation, it's all leading to a new world order. People don't like Yahweh's old world order. <laughs> they think we need a new world order. Okay. Well, we dissect this a little bit in the study on Revelation and the end times. And Father willing, we hope to dive into this a lot more in the Abraham Accords series and the series on the four horses. Uh, but basically what you have is you have Zira, you have black horse Judah is in the head, is in control of Babylon. That's because they're the kingship tribe. So they're the head of gold, but it's the black horse owns it. Black controls red. Uh, whether you're talking Zira controls it through manipulative means, or whether you're talking parrots who just outright is smart, studies hard, works hard, saves his money, invests wisely, uh, is conservative in those. You know, so bl the black controls red, basically. And then you come down, you've got the two legs. We'll talk, we talk about that more in the Revelation series. Uh, if you want to know more, please refer to our study on Revelation and the End Times or Revelation Simplified on YouTube. And we'll talk about that. There's also a good resource in the Revelation news if you want to know how the news plays out in the Revelation timeline, where we are in the timeline, how things are progressing on the timeline, uh, Revelation news pages for you. So, but people have a <clears throat> really hard time with this. I realize that probably your your Haredi Jews have, have no problem with the concept that democracy is wrong. Uh, many of them are, are very much against uh well, you even have anti-Zionist Jews who believe we need to wait for Yahweh to manifest his king. So we take a look here in Wikipedia. We just come to the history of democracy, and it tells us that democracy, red horse, Asavite, Greco-Roman, Babylonian democracy, is a political system, <clears throat> excuse me, or a system of decision-making within an institution, organization, or state in which members share the power. Okay, we're not going to have a kingship. We're not going to we're not going to look for Yahweh's anointed and then listen to him. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to do what we want. Okay, so instead of you know, we know there has to be a king, but we all want to be king. So we have this secret kingship sharing strategy where we all get to pretend that we're all a little bit of the king, whether or not Yahweh has chosen us for the job or not. Big mistake. Modern democracies are characterized by two capabilities of their citizens that differentiate them fundamentally from earlier forms of government. 
okay, to intervene in society and to have their sovereign, in other words, their representatives, right? Because it's a kingship sharing strategy that all the people get to be king and they have representatives, okay? Worldly representatives. That's how Aesop works. Ace so there's a very important, very interesting article in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, basically hit your internet search engine, type in primitive democracy in ancient Mesopotamia. It's a well-known study by a scholar by the name of Thorkild Jacobson. Anyway, he covers a lot of good material in here. Here's just some quotations. In early Sumer, we're talking about your fertile crescent, Tigris and Euphrates, kings like Gilgamesh did not hold the autocratic power that later Mesopotamian rulers wielded. Okay, rather, so you had the rise of cities. So you had, this is where it all began. Rather, major city-states functioned with councils of elders and what they called young men, which were likely the army, free men bearing arms. And they possessed the final political authority and had to be consulted on all major issues such as war. Okay, do we see this? So you have a king but he doesn't have the final say-so. He doesn't have the final authority. He in turn has to be accountable or responsible, not to Yahweh, but to a council of elders and to militia, to free men bearing arms, nobles, this kind of a thing. So we talk about this in Revelation, the end times. Babylon in Hebrew is Bavel. Basically, it means confusion. So if you're into Hebrew word pictures, the bet, is the is a symbolic of a house, in this case, the Council of Elders. Then you have another bet, which is another house, which is the house of the free men bearing arms, the militia. And so you've got, and then the Lamed is authority. So what you've got here is you've got divided bicameral authority. Does that sound anything familiar to the religious and political systems of today? We need to understand Babylon's religious and political systems go hand in glove. Right. So you're talking about the first beast, the second beast of Revelation. You've got a political beast and a religious beast, and they go together. Okay, so this is the Babylonian system. And then you have uh, frenemies. Every, the left fights the right, and the right fights the left, and everyone fights everyone. All the horses fight each other, and that's how they break down and trample the whole world. Read all about it in Revelation the end times. Here's what Yahweh says, if anyone is interested in that. Devarim or Deuteronomy, for instance, 12 and verse 8 says, you shall not at all do as we are doing here today with every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. And that's basically what democracy is, is a system of sharing the kingship with every man getting to vote and cast his ballot for what seems right in his own eyes. And somehow we just have this idea that people are going to be selfish and they're going to vote their own selfish interest. And when you have a majority of people voting for their own selfish interest, somehow that's supposed to yield a selfless uh, kind of a unicorn and rainbow world that the young people are all hoping for with socialism, communism. It's all red horse. Democracy, it's all red horse. The people rule. Okay, that's Asov. He's got a way of doing what he wants to do and dressing it up to make it look like it comes from the most high. Okay, that's mystery Babylon right there. We're gonna see this again in, I believe about three parashio from now. So Bamidbar or Numbers chapter 16, starting verse one. Korah, the son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Datan of Aviram, the sons of Eliav. And on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben took men and they rose up before Moshe, whom Yahweh had called to serve, to serve, to lead through service. Servant leader, with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives, there's that word again, of the congregation, men of renown. So does that sound anything familiar to the bicameral government legislature? We have representatives, we have men of renown, people vote for what seems good and right in their own eyes. Verse 3, they gathered together against Moshe and Aharon and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is set apart, every one of them, and Yahweh is among them. Okay, everyone's set apart. And that's true. The congregation of Israel is set apart from the world. 
but there's different degrees of set apartness. There's at least four different degrees, perhaps more. It says, so why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? Okay, Yahweh called you. Why are you taking that role? Why are you, why are you listening to Yahweh and not listening to us? Okay, that's democracy right there. And this is what later, this is a foreshadowing we will see of Talmudic rabbinic authority. That's coming up later in this parasha. So we get to the renewed covenant. We'll talk about this later. We're talking about voting. We're talking about democracy. Matthew, Yahoo, or Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25. But Yeshua knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom that is divided against itself. That's what you have in Babylon. You have a house against a house. They're splitting the authority. It's not going to work. It's like modern marriages where you have equal partners. They don't work. That's not the way human beings are created. So it says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house or family or marriage or congregation or theological system or nation that is divided against itself, such as Judah being against Ephraim, will not stand. Okay, when we talk about this, if you want to know the high-level theory, uh, the top lining, you can find that in our study on Torah government. That's a high-level theory. If you want to know the more practical applications and more common questions, why, search, check out the Acts 15 order study. And we're going to take a short break, and then we'll go to our Torah portion. Welcome back. So actually, just a quick administrative announcement. Uh, we've, we're sitting down to count the cost about going live. We don't have the resources at this time. We would love to go live, but it adds additional burdens to the time schedule. It throws the time schedule out of whack. And we don't have the enough support and resources to make up the difference. So if you would like us to broadcast live, please pray for Yahweh to raise up support through his elect. So we're going to jump right into the Torah portion. And it continues, it picks up from last week where Yahweh is assigning the duties among the priestly clans. So in Bamidbar chapter 4, starting in verse 21, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Take also a census of the sons of Gershon by their father's house, by their families from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old you shall number them, all who enter to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. And like we were talking about last week, there is service and there is work that Yahweh commands in the tabernacle of meeting, and there's also service and work that he commands under the order of Melchizedek. So, we all need to sit down and count the cost and ask ourselves. We need to think about the day of judgment. We need to think about what it's going to be like. We're standing right there. And Yahweh asks us, did you do everything I said? And we say no. And you turn to Yeshua for help. And he says, did you do what I said? And we say no. That's going to be a bad time. And people need to really pray about that. Okay, so... Continuing on in verse 29, as for the sons of Merari, you shall number them by their families and by their father's houses. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, you shall number them, everyone who enters the service or the army to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And like we talked about last week, uh, this is Strong's Hebrew 6635, it's Sava. So it's a massive, it's an army. It's a massive person's regularly or especially organized for war. So <laughs> we need to understand there's two different armies. The priesthood is an army, has to be run like an army, same in the renewed covenant. It's not different. The principles and the precepts are exactly the same. They just, the application is a little different because we're in the dispersion. We don't have a cleansed altar. We can't unify around that. We have a different function in the overall strategy. We talk about that in Torah government. Continuing in verse 42, again, those are the families of the sons of Merari who were numbered by their families, by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who entered the army for work in the tabernacle of meeting. And a lot of people have a real peacetime attitude about service to Yahweh. It's all about us getting the blessings. That's why there's so many Christians. That's why there's a hundred times more Christians than there are Jews. 
It's because you have a few people, they understand, well, if he's a real Elohim, he's going to have real requirements. And you have Ephraim, who's dreaming, drinking drunk. He's thinking, wow, I just come and get what I want. Rub the genie lamp, rub the genie bottle, get what I want. I'm gone. It doesn't work. It's not real. But that's why you have 100 times more Christians and only 10% will come back. Okay, continuing in Numbers chapter 5, Yahweh's talking about purity in the camp. He's walking among the camp. He's here with us in the camp. So that's why he wants everyone who has leprosy, we'll talk about that in other places, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse, you shall put outside the camp. So they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. Yahweh's big on sanitation. He's big on medical intervention. He's big on hygiene. So that's what that's all about. Verse 5, Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. When a man or woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against Yahweh, okay, they're breaking Yahweh's commands. They're breaking Yahweh's will. They're not trying to be a single family of man, taking care of their brother and sister, helping to build a single family that can take care of each other so together we can do his will. They're not trying to do that. They don't care about Yahweh's will. They just want to come to him to get blessings. You know, hey, dad, can I have the car keys? That's, that's unfaithfulness to Yahweh. Okay, so when he figures that out, verse 7, then he shall confess the sin which he has committed. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full. So if he's wronged a fellow Israelite, if he's wronged some or wronged any human being, if he's done something wrong, okay, we don't, we don't just mistreat other peoples. We make restitution for the trespass in full, plus we add one-fifth to it and give it to the one that we have wronged. Verse 8, but if the one we have wronged has no relative, suppose it's a, a ger Sadiq or a ger Toshav or a, a returning Gentile Ephraimite, okay, he doesn't happen to have relatives in the nation, he's returning. So, but if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go to Yahweh for the priest in addition to the ram of atonement with which atonement is made. So again, this word atonement, that's the word at one -ment. So we're trying to make things all one again. And if we wrong someone, especially anyone inside the nation or outside the nation, but especially in the nation, it's like if you're going to wrong your spouse and you're not going to mention it, you're not going to make restitution, you're not going to make amends, you're just going to kind of brush it under the rug. And you're going to mistreat some of your family members and you're just going to brush, you're not going to talk about it. You're just going to brush it under the rug. Okay, so when I was studying for a PhD in psychology, that's the one principle that all branches of psychology agree on is if you're going to have secrets, you're going to have family dysfunction. Okay, so House of Judah. Levy, you guys have a lot of secrets. Okay, secrets lead to familial dysfunction. Ephraim also. Okay, so Numbers 5, verse 11, Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him. Now this is what they call the parasha, or the Torah of the Sotah. So we take a look at this word to go astray. It's a Strong's Hebrew 7847. In this passage in the Tanakh, it's sata. Okay, so it's a primitive root to deviate from duty, to turn aside, to go to go aside, to turn. And then the term sota comes, I believe, from the Talmud, but it's a related term. So in Judaism, you call it the Torah of the Sota, the Torah of the, the deviating one. And then whereas in the Ephraimite side, usually we refer to this as the Torah of the jealous husband, and we'll see why. So coming back, continuity verse there. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, if any man's wife goes astray, sata, and behaves unfaithfully toward him, and a man lies with her carnally, and it's hidden from the eyes of her husband, and it's concealed that she's defiled herself, 
and there was no witness against her, nor was she caught. Verse 14, if the spirit of jealousy comes upon her husband, he becomes jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself. Okay, he doesn't know. He's confused. He's jealous. He doesn't know what's going on. Verse 15, then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it because it's a grain offering of jealousy. It's an offering for remembering to bring iniquity to remembrance. Okay, so what are we, what are we really talking about here? Okay, something's gone wrong. Someone has turned aside. Someone's done the wrong thing. The husband doesn't know what he suspects, so he's jealous. Verse 16. One moment. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before Yahweh. The priest shall take set apart water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that's on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. Verse 18. Then the priest shall stand before the woman, shall stand the woman before Yahweh, uncover the woman's head, which implies that it was covered when she entered the sanctuary environment. We'll talk about that and put the offering for remembering her iniquity in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. Now, let's just take a quick note here. We don't have time to cover this whole thing. We have a, a study called Head Coverings in Scripture. Uh, in some of the older versions, it's in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 1, and currently it's in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 2. Uh, but that's a very important study just for the simple fact that people need to learn to submit to Elohim. People need to learn to submit to Elohim's rules and his laws and his ways. So when you see something like verse 18, and it says, the priest shall stand the woman before Yahweh and uncover the woman's head. Now, I have heard more flack and more fight and more fire over this from the women. I mean, the joke is there's some women that would prefer to start World War III than obey this verse. And you'll get a lot of a lot of conflict, a lot of controversy, a lot of hate. A lot of people will say, well, there's no direct commandment for the woman to cover her head. But, uh, you know, if we're going to believe this book and we're going to believe there's an Elohim, and he calls us to be a set-apart people, and he has certain rules. And it says, when you're in the temple, so then you have a bunch of women, they say, well, well, I'll cover my head when I'm, if I'm ever in the temple. Okay, we're not going we're not, we're not to do the Talmudic temple. We're going to wait for a clean, pure temple. We're waiting for the fourth temple for after Armageddon, because we're just not, there's no point in us participating in a Talmudic temple when the Talmud calls for our death. That doesn't make sense to us. It never will. It's against Genesis 12, 3. Give it up. Ephraim needs to give it up. Okay, it says here, the priest shall stand the woman before Yahweh and uncover the woman's head. Okay, doesn't that imply that it needs to be covered? In order for it to be uncovered, first it has to be covered. Okay, we talk about this. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, Father willing, in the future, we want to rewrite this study. There's even more information now. When you start to get into divine counsel theology, there's even literally more reasons for women to cover the head. Okay, so we'll talk, we talk about that more in that study, but let's continue on in Bamidbar, chapter 5 and verse 19. Then the priest shall put her under oath and say to the woman, if no man has lain with you and you have not gone astray to uncleanness, okay, you're innocent, you didn't do anything, while you're under your husband's authority, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. Verse 20, but if you have gone astray while well, under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself and some man other than your husband has lain with you, verse 21, 
then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse. And he shall say to the woman, Yahweh make you a curse and an oath among your people when Yahweh makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. And she's going to have some kind of a problem. Verse 22, and may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, so be it. Verse 23, Then the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell and her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself, she hasn't done anything wrong, she's innocent, she's pure, and she's clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. Okay, this is the Torah of jealousy, which is why Ephraim calls it the Torah of the jealous husband. But this is the Torah of jealousy when a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself. Okay, so, well, let's continue on. Verse 30, For when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man, and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand the woman before Yahweh, and the priest shall execute all of this Torah upon her. Okay, once again, her head has to be covered in order for it to be uncovered. Okay, a lot of women treat it like female circumcision. Okay, it's not that bad. Uh, when you first go to cover your head, uh, it's very uncomfortable because you want to be part of the world. You want to be in the world. So you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to lose being part of the world. You want to keep one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. It doesn't work, sisters. Okay? There's things men have to do they don't want to do. There's things sisters have to do they don't want to do. That's just how it is. We have to acknowledge that Yahweh gives us commandments that are the opposite of our fleshly carnal nature. Okay, that's the spirit and the flesh are at odds with one another. They're at permanent enmity with one another. And we have to sit down and count the cost and ask ourselves, how much is it going to be worth <laughs> to have yeah, whatever flaunted our beauty or whatever when we're standing there before Elohim it's like, did you do what I said to do, or did you not say what I not do what I said to do? Was your heart with me in this thing, or are you just here for the blessings? Like 99% of Ephraim. Okay, verse 30. For when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand the woman before Yahweh, and the priest shall execute all this Torah upon her. Then the man shall be free from iniquity. But that woman shall bear her guilt. And there's a lot of people have a lot of issue with this. So we need to talk about this. What are the reasons for this? Because it sounds, when you first hear about it, when you're coming at it from a worldly perspective, it seems kind of unfair. But why does the husband get to be jealous and suspicious of his wife? And then the wife just doesn't get, there's, there's nothing. It's, it's not the same. So uh, women resent having to cover their heads. There's a lot of, um, part of women's power comes from their attractiveness. And so if you conceal your attractiveness and, and keep it, save it for your husband, uh, that represents a real discipline. That rec represents a real, uh, it's a change. And so if people don't want to do that, again, there's a lot of people in the house of Ephraim, they get, they're trying to have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world or maybe uh, one foot and three toes in the world, or something like that. Okay, but let's just talk about this. We want to be fair. We want to understand Yahweh's commandments are righteous. Yahweh is our creator. He's the engineer. He made us. He knows what we need. He understands there's differences between men and women. We're called to different roles. Okay, part of the popular culture right now is to erase the thought that there's any kind of differences between men and women. That's a major principle in communism, socialism, red horse. And again, black controls red. Uh, but 
so they're, they're trying to break down Yahweh's natural order so they can replace it with a Talmudic order. It's not going to work. It's going to, well, it's going to work for about 20, well, we talk about the Revelation study. It's going to work for quite some time, a few decades, and then it's not going to work anymore. Uh, but why is it that the man has the right to have a Torah of jealousy and the, the wife doesn't have the same right? Okay, why is that? Okay, why would Yahweh say that? He's a loving creator. He cares about us. He's not giving us anything ridiculous. He's not giving us anything unnecessary. He's not giving us anything unnecessarily biased one way or the other. Why would he do that? Well, again, there's a lot of people that would try to convince us that men and women are the same, and they're not. And one of the things has to do with the investment Involved, and this is this is not to excuse it. This is uh, if a man commits adultery against his wife, the penalty is death. Okay, so the question is only why does the man have the right to <laughs> to to pay for the ritual and then have this done in the temple? Why would he do that? Okay, well, there's some shocking statistics out there. Uh, this is from thebusinessdesk.com. It said this is a result of a study. Nearly half of men who take a paternity test are not the real father. Okay, so, and this was done in the UK, and there were some areas, I think in southern England, where it's actually more like 60%. Now, understand, this is not to say that almost half of men who are married, that their children are not theirs. Okay, that's, that's not what this says. This says nearly half of men who take a paternity test are not the real dad. But one of the things we need to understand, so they've done other studies in that article. They talk about other studies. They reference other studies, and you can find other studies on the internet. Uh, these are reputable studies that are done. And something like, it depends on your estimate, but, but somewhere in between 10 to 30% of men, it's not your child that you're raising. And so this is one of the things that really goes on. And you can find psychologists to talk about this. A lot of women will get into a marriage to have support, and then they will have someone else's child. And I don't know how common it is in the faith. Obviously, people don't talk about this, but they've done it with genetic studies. We do not recommend having your genetics studied. There's people who, uh, <clears throat> there's rumors that people are making bioweapons. perhaps even targeted <clears throat> to specific groups. So um, do not recommend having those studies done, but they, so the, the, the more realistic estimates, there was one study that said 11% and one study that said 12%. That's their estimate of men in the general population. So basically about one out of every nine men, they're raising children that are not their own but they think that they're their own. And this is in addition to adopting children, this kind of a thing. One out of nine. So uh, again, we don't know uh, inside the faith community, outside the faith community, we don't know, but this is a common thing that happens in the world is, uh, we'll talk about this in more detail some other time, but that's one of the things when you, when you go to do one-on-one -on -one mating, one-on-one -on -one pair bonding for life, uh, there's certain changes to the natural order that have to take place. This is a, a this is a way of setting yourself apart. Not everyone in Israel sets themselves apart. Both houses, Judah, Ephraim, not everyone's doing it. So you know, <laughs> one out of nine. So it's and this is not to excuse it, but if the man goes astray, he doesn't end up raising someone else's child. Okay, he actually freeloads someone else raises his child, he's deserving of death. But if the woman does that, then the man is spending his life raising someone else's children. So that's a serious difference in investment. So that's why it says, uh, well, yeah, here we go. So verse 31, that's why it says, then the man shall be free from iniquity, but that woman shall bear her guilt. And I can definitely understand why people would have problems with 
this verse, uh, it does seem, well, obviously the woman is the one who's standing trial or going through the ordeal. Um, but when we think about this, you know, if we believe that Yahweh is Elohim, and then again, the man has other things that he has to do that the women don't have to do. So it, it works out. That's it's Yahweh's system. He knows how he wants it to work out. So that's my understanding of why he would say a thing like that. But, you know, if someone, it was kind of like a lie detector test or, or you know, a truth serum or something, you know, we're taking an oath. If someone is, uh, father, father forbid, but suppose there's a murder and someone doesn't know who committed the murder uh, and someone accuses you. And then, okay, so what are you going to do? They have no proof. They have no evidence. What can they do? They can stand you before the priest and they can, you, if you're wearing a crown, take your crown. If you're, you know, whatever, just, just do what you need to do. You're standing bare before Yahweh and he wants you to swear. Did you commit this murder? If so, Yahweh will kill you. Or did you not commit this murder? If so, Yahweh will let you go free. If you didn't do it, and you believe in Yahweh, what's the harm? Okay, you're placing the matter in Yahweh's hands. Okay, now let's take a look and see what happens if we do not place the matter in Yahweh's hands. What happens if we give in to our suspicions or if we try to come up with another solution, a man-made solution to this? Okay, let's come to the Safaria website, Tractate Yevamot 24b. It's a free open website. You can make an account. So come to uh, Yevamot 24b. Uh, we just pulled out some quotes. If you wish, say a different answer for Rav's explanation. So Rav has been explaining why you have to divorce a wife if anyone suspects her. So it says, those baratot, or those entries in the Talmud, that require the wife and the suspected adult. So I just to catch people up. So again, Judah has a different program. Judah doesn't go by Tanakh. Judah goes by the Talmud and calls it Torah. Or they call it Torah law. If you want to specify the Torah of Moshe, you have to say the written Torah or the Torah of Moshe. They go, oh yeah, that ancient document way back then. They treat it like in the United States. They say, oh, constitution, constitution, no one cares. They treat it like the Magna Carta or well, and they say, well, the Torah of Moshe, that's way older than that. That's no longer any good as a legal precedent because it's too old. We need something in the modern era. So the rabbis have this idea that instead of Yahweh giving them the Torah, and then the Levitical order was to maintain and teach Yahweh's Torah, they got the idea that Yahweh gave them the authority to establish a Torah in each generation and of course, it develops and grows, and you have legal precedents and all kinds of things that are completely different than what Yahweh says. And so we're getting, in general, the comments are a lot better, but we still get comments. People don't like hearing about this. You know, um, I don't know what to say to Brother Judah. I've met some really lovely Jewish people. I have yet to meet an Orthodox rabbi that I thought was a lovely person. Uh, hope it will happen someday. Uh, we're hoping to hearing from the rabbis. If you have genuine comment, genuine concerns, if you'd like to start some genuine dialogue, uh, but right now the rabbis are following essentially their own program. They follow the Talmud and say they're following Yahweh. They say they're keeping the Torah and they're not. Okay. So they're talking about why you have to put your wife away. Okay. When the Torah, when the Torah doesn't say it, the Tanakh doesn't say it. And they have all these reasons why you have to put your wife away. So, well, if you wish, if you want, you can say a different answer for Rob's explanation. Those entries or those baratot that require the wife and the suspected adulterer to divorce, even without witnesses to the adultery, are taught in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi or Judah the Prince. And just to catch uh, any Christians up, so uh, Rabbi Judah the Prince, and I don't know the exact dates, but he was about almost 200 years after the time of Yeshua. So I believe he redacted the, the Talmud, the Mishnah, 
around 220 CE. Sorry, I don't know the corresponding date off the top of my head. And then basically, uh, these these were documents that existed prior to that, but then they were redacted or edited or censored, or uh, he gave us what he wanted us to have or whatever, however that went. But Rabbi Judy, Judah Hanasi basically is the one who brought the rabbinical order to the forefront. So before the writing of the Talmud, you had rabbis, but they, they weren't the mainstream thing as they are now. Anyway, that's a topic for another time. Let's continue on here. Uh, Yevamot 24b. As it is taught in a baraita, with regard to a case where a husband saw a peddler leaving the house, and when he entered, he found his wife retying her smock, okay, putting her clothes back on. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, since this is a distasteful matter, because it looks as though she committed adultery with the peddler, she must be divorced by her husband. Okay, just because of appearances, she must be divorced. That's shocking to an Ephraimite. Uh, continuing, Alternately, if the husband entered after the peddler had left and found saliva above the netting of the bed, so they got a bug net and there's saliva up top, implying that someone had lain on the bed and spit upward, although no actual act was witnessed, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, since this is a distasteful matter, she must be divorced. <laughs> So continuing, <clears throat> now you're on to tractate 25A, which is the front side of page 25. The same applies if the husband found shoes reversed under the bed or so that the toe of the shoe faced the bed. Okay. This is a sign that a stranger came in and placed them like that. <clears throat> Maybe, could be your children were in there. We don't know. Uh, but <laughs> this is a sign that a stranger came in and placed them like that. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, since this is a distasteful matter, she must be divorced. Okay, well, it goes on. Now, the Gemara, which is commentary on the Mishnah, questions this. So, shoes turn around, well, let him see whose they are and clarify who the stranger was and then find out what he was doing there. Maybe it was something legitimate. Rather, the case was that he found the place of the shoes, in other words, shoe prints, reversed under the bed and cannot recognize whose shoe prints they are. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, since this is a distasteful matter, she must be divorced. Okay. The Gemara concludes, the commentary on the Mishnah concludes, the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of Rav that they must divorce only if there were witnesses. And the halacha is also in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi that they must divorce if there's a matter that is distasteful. The Gemara challenges this. It says one halacha is difficult as it contradicts the other halacha. So these two are at odds to, with each other. <clears throat> you guys <clears throat> get dizzy just reading the thing. The Gemara answers, this contradiction is not difficult. The one relates to a case where the rumor ceases and the woman is sent away only if there are witnesses. But that one relates to a case where the rumor does not cease, in which case he divorces her even if there are no witnesses. Yeah, and, so, and then it goes on to say in, in other passages, it goes on to talk about how uh, how long does it take for a rumor not to cease. It's like if it goes more than about a day and a half, then it's a rumor that doesn't cease. Therefore, he has to divorce her. So the Gemara elucidates the cases. In cases of a rumor that does not cease, in other words, it goes on for more than a day and a half, even if there are no witnesses, the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and he divorces her. <clears throat> We learned in a Mishnah there, Gitin 45b, a man who divorces his wife due to her bad reputation may not take her back again, even if it turns out 
that the rumor was not true. Did you catch that? A man who divorces his wife due to her bad reputation may not take her back again, even if it turns out that the rumor was untrue. There's a bad rumor, lasts for more than a day and a half, got to put your wife away, you're not taking her back. No way. Even if the rumor was untrue. Continuing, so too the sages said in the case of one who divorced his wife due to her reputation or vow that he may not take her back, and if he does remarry her, he must divorce her, even if it was not true. Now, what does Yahweh say in this whole thing? Forgive me. I mean, does Levi, I mean, you get so wrapped up in this thing. Now, I say this with respect. I know we're going to get a lot of hateful comments in the comments, but we're doing this to prepare for the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph to come back together as one. Okay, if we're not going to unite on Yahweh's word, how are we ever going to unite? How's that ever going to happen? Okay, Ephraim has to give up his Esauvite ways. Judah has to give up his Talmudic ways because we both claim to have the Tanakh in common. And our belief is if you really are in the Tanakh, you will end up in the Brit Hadashah. So, but there's no way around. The, the only way for us to unify is to unify on Elohim's words. That's going to take submission to Elohim, not the rabbinical order, not the Talmud, not the Gemara, not the Zohar. It's going to take submission to Elohim's voice, including all the written records of Elohim's voice by both houses. That's what we're going to need. There's no other way. But so what Yahweh says in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, and this is the second thing that you do. He's talking to Judah. This is the second thing that you do. You cover the altar of Yahweh with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard your offering anymore nor does he receive it with goodwill from your hands. And Levi and Judah say, what? Why? For what reason? Well, because Yahweh has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, that you're talking about putting away due to rumors in the Talmud, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Okay, now, if we believe this book, okay, who, who's it talking to here? Okay, and if this is a prophecy for today, then what is the situation today? And why does it seem to match the Talmud exactly? This is what he's talking about. Okay, you're dealing treacherously with her, even though she's your companion and your wife by covenant. Verse 15, it says, and didn't he make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why did he make them one flesh? He says, because he seeks righteous offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth, like it's saying in the Talmud. Verse 16, for Yahweh Elohim of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says Yahweh of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. And that's exactly what the Talmud is talking about. He's talking about dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth. That's it. So either we're going to submit to Yahweh's voice and do what he said, or we're going to make up our own stuff. We're going to have a hard time in the judgment. People need to be serious about that. People need to sit down and count the cost. Okay, so we come to Bamidbar chapter 6. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself unto Yahweh. Okay, now we, we're not going to have time to cover all this material. There's a lot of material we could go into here. We could camp on this for a while. We have a study in on the Nazarene Israel website called Yeshua the Celibate Nazarite. It covers why he was a Nazarite, why he was celibate, why that's technically our ideal. Uh, I'm not sure which one of the studies it's in. It's either in, either in Nazarene Scripture Studies 1 or 2. I'm not sure which one. We also have another study in the Covenant Relationships Collection called Abstinence, Celibacy, and Nazarites. 
That one helps to explain where Nazarites fit in in the ecosystem, if you will. We take a look at this word. It's Strong's Hebrew 5139, Nazir. That's Nun Zayin Resh. So it comes from 5144. It means to separate or to consecrate, to set apart as a prince or as a Nazarite. Uh, it's distinguished. You're setting them apart. That They become set apart. Hence, figuratively from the latter, an unpruned vine, like an unshorn Nazarite. And it comments, the translation Nazarite is by a false alliteration with Nazareth. I'm not sure if Strong's knows what they're talking about there, but it means separated. Okay, so uh, let's just take a look here. So you got the, I don't know if you can see this, but Nazir is Nun Zain Resh, Nazaret, or Nazrat is Nun Tzadi Resh Tav. It's a different root. So I'm not saying there's no, I'm not saying there's no sound association or alliteration. Uh, a lot of times there's plays on words in scripture. Uh, you can come up with lots of connections, but those are two separate roots. They're two separate words. Okay, so we come to the root here. It's Strong's Hebrew 5144. It's a primitive root to hold aloof. You're not part of the crowd. So that is intransitively to abstain from food or from drink or from impurity. And even from, if it's a wrong worship, you can even abstain from that. Okay, but specifically, what we're interested in, specifically it's to set apart for set apart purposes or to devote something, to consecrate something, or to separate something for a divine purpose. Okay, that's the point. Okay, so it's Nazar if it's consecrated or set apart for a divine purpose. We see this word Nazir also in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 49 and verse 26, where Israel is blessing our forefather Joseph. He says, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers when he was sold into Egypt. So we come to Bamidbar 6 and verse 3. So in Nazarite, his job is to separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine. Okay, so we're talking no balsamic vinegar, no white wine vinegar, nothing like that. Nor vinegar made from similar drink. So any kind of vinegar made from alcohol is out. Uh, neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat any fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. So if it's a great, and I've had people ask me, <laughs> is it okay? Can we have the grape leaf tea or can we have something from the root? It's like, no, no, just, just stay away. Okay. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. Just avoid, avoid, avoid. Grapes, bad. Verse 5, all the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head <clears throat> until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to Yahweh. So you can take a vow for a month, for a year, for a lifetime. Whatever it is that you decide, at least in theoretical terms, if there's a temple standing, a cleansed temple. So all the days that he vows, he shall be set apart. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow long. Okay, so just stop cutting your hair, stop cutting your beard. Just stop trying to make yourself some other way than Yahweh made you. Just be who Yahweh made you. Verse 6. All the days that he separates himself to Yahweh, he shall not go near a dead body. His focus is on the living, service to the living Elohim among his people who are living. We're not, and then there's no time. It's a triage situation. We got to, got to, got to focus on the things. Verse seven, he shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother. What's the benefit for his brother or his sister when they die? because his separation to Elohim is on his head. He's serving Yahweh Elohim. He's not serving family. He's not serving personal needs and wants. He's not serving his 
spouse more than Elohim. Okay, Elohim comes first. Okay, verse 8, all the days of his separation, he shall be set apart to Yahweh. <clears throat> Verse 9, and if anyone dies very suddenly beside him, we'll talk about this, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. Then on the eighth day he brings sacrifices. Bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And before we continue, let's discuss verse 9. So, the way I understand this is that the Nazarite is not supposed to be about war. The Nazarite is supposed to be about peace. So we're talking about someone dying very suddenly beside him. We're talking about a battlefield environment. We're talking about uh, hospice care. Well, that's not that's not very suddenly, uh, but but any kind of a sudden death. Also, when we understand Yahweh is completely in charge of everything. If you pay attention to what goes on around you versus your focus on Yahweh, there's a correspondence. When you're with Yahweh, things go smoothly. Things go much, well, not, not smoothly, but things go much better. When you're not focused on Yahweh, bad stuff happens to turn your focus to Yahweh. He has to get your attention. So let's listen for the still small voice. Let's listen for the whisper so we don't have to get hit with the brick to wake us up first. Okay, so that's that's another way to understand it. But if anyone dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his, de- his head on the day of his cleansing. And he brings two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So this implies, and there's differences of understanding, can you separate it without a temple, without a cleansed temple or tabernacle? I would say no. I know people who say yes. So, uh, verse 11, and the priest shall offer one as a sin offering. Okay, we're going to come back to that in the Hadashah section. The priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned in regard to the corpse. And he shall sanctify his head on that same day. Verse 12. He shall consecrate to Yahweh the days of his separation and bring a male lamb in the first year as a trespass offering, but the former days shall be lost because his separation was defiled. This is something that it's service to Yahweh. You're dedicating your life. You're dedicating your service to Yahweh. Okay, what, what most people consider normal, that doesn't come into play. Okay, we're setting ourselves apart to Yahweh here. Verse 13. Now, this is the Torah of the Nazir, of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, if there's no cleansed tabernacle or temple, I don't see how that can be fulfilled, but there's other opinions. Verse 14. And he shall present his offering to Yahweh, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering. We'll come back to that. And one ram without blemish as a peace offering. Okay, so one of the sacrifices, there's three animal sacrifices. One of them is for sin. Verse 15, and a basket of unleavened cakes, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil and their grain offering with their drink offerings. Then the priest shall bring them before Yahweh and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. Okay, again, we're going to come back to the fact that when the Nazarite separates his vow, one of his three animal offerings is for sin, even in the renewed covenant. Verse 21, he says, This is the Torah of the Nazarite who vows to Yahweh the offering for his separation. And besides that, whatever else his hand is able to provide. So he's going all in. And I know people, it's like, they've got like a fashion Nazarite thing or whatever they do. It's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous uh, version of the Nazarite vow. People will take it for 30 days or they'll, and and we'll talk about that. I mean, they, they can, people, you can make it for whatever length of time. I think the main thing is your reasons for it. 
Uh, there's a lot of people, they think it'd be trendy. They think it'd be cool to be a Nazarite. Uh, a lot of young people, you need to just not make vows until you hear from Yahweh. Okay, because this is, you know, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Okay, so, but it talks about, he shall offer whatever else his hand is able to provide. So we take a look at the, we don't have time in this presentation, but take a look at the example of Yeshua. Take a look at the example of John the Baptist. They basically went all in. So you can take less than that. You can make a lesser vow according to the vow which he takes. So he must do according to the Torah of his separation. So in other words, you can vow a certain amount or you can go all in. It's, it's, uh, it depends on how you do it. So there's more information in the study, Yeshua, the celibate Nazarite. But now we're going to go to Bumibar chapter 6, continuing on, starting in verse 23. Yahweh says to speak to Aharon and his sons. Saying, <laughs> this is, okay, saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Okay, this is how Yahweh wants his priesthood to bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Okay, not Hashem, not Adonai. Okay, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Verse 27, so they shall put my name, not some other name, not a substitute name, but his name on the children of Israel and Yahweh himself will bless them. Okay, but in order for this to happen, we have to use his name. And once again, we have to use his words. We have to go by his words and not by our own traditions. Now, if you've ever been there, they also have, uh, there's a traditional rabbinical hand sign that they will say allegedly derives from Song of Songs, uh, chapter two, verses eight and nine. So what they're saying is, I mean, you'll, you'll hear all sorts of things. You'll hear that this is the exact same hand sign that, that Aharon used to bless the people back in uh, back in Torah times. And then you'll hear also that it's allegedly derived from the Song of Songs, chapter two, starting in verse eight and nine, meaning it's a later edition. It was derived from Song of Songs. It can't be the tradition that Moshe handed down. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so take a look at it. Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, chapter two, verse nine. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. Okay, now, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that when they, forgive me, but when they make their hand sign, whatever they do, it's sort of like looking through the lattice. And there's all sorts of Kabbalistic interpretations that the Shekinah, you're not supposed to look at the hands and this kind of a thing. Uh, very, very deep Kabbalistic replacement theology going on there. But uh, now this is from Henry Makow's website. Again, I hate to keep dipping into his website, but he's done great research. His article, Nimoy's Vulcan hand sign is an invocation of the devil. Now, with all respect to uh, Leonard Nimoy, who's uh, no longer living, uh, I, the art, this is a very good article. I, uh, so with respect to Leonard Nimoy, he was a devoted Kabbalist and Kabbalists don't always tell you the truth in their upfront reasons for things. They'll give you a nice sounding reason. And the real reason that they do things is something else. This is, this is circumstantial, but this is the Rider Waite Tarot deck. This is uh, number 15, the devil. And the devil has a certain hand sign. It's believed that that is an invocation of the devil. So <clears throat> Leonard Nimoy can say what he wants. 
but this is right here. And then you have, uh, this is also very interesting. We could go on, we could camp on this for, but we don't have time. Anyway, if you're interested, just hit your internet search engines. You can search, that's a good article by Henry Makow. I recommend that as a good starting point. Uh, this is, uh, if you got $20 and you want, you can go on eBay. I just got a screen grab here. This is a postcard from 1908, 1908, and it's got what they call the triad claw. Now, forgive me, uh, this is not, <laughs> but but so here's the, basically a satanic inv invocation, and they just reverse it. So if you're, if you're, if you're Kabbalistic, this is your interpretation. And if you're a Masonic controlled by the Kabbalist because black controls red, then this is your, your triad claw because that's the Masonic lodge Illuminati. They're owned by zero basically. So, and this is a very ancient thing. It goes back a long way. So this is the founder of the Jesuit order, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, who Oh, if you read the book, 1666, uh, salvation through sin, or salvation by sinning, uh, you, you learn that the, the Jesuit order was founded by crypt, crypto Jews, Zira, basically. So Zira goes undercover generationally. So you got your Jesuits and you've also got your, <clears throat> the Dunme, I don't know if that's pronounced right, but the Dunme is the Islamic version of that. Uh, they've infiltrated, here's your Jesuit Pope. And so that you've got a hidden hand sign. And this was all over the place as well for Masons. So just they're controlled by a hidden hand, which is Zira. So black controls red. So uh, we're going to take a short break and we'll continue in our half drop. Okay, we're going to come now to our half drop prophetic portion. So much information this week. We're just going to have to dive right in. I'm going to refer you to some places. But before we begin, let's take a quick review of the four main roles in Israel, or you could say three and then anointed judges the fourth. So you have the kingship. Okay, he's the head of the temporal army and the host. So in this case, we're going to see Shimshon or Samson. He's going to be mainly in the king. He is an anointed judge. He's a special combination of all three gifts, but he focuses mainly, his gifting was mainly in the kingship, serving on the battlefields, so to speak. We're also going to take a quick look at Shemuel, there was no king in Shemuel's day. He's the one who anointed first King Shaul and then King David. But before that, he served as a priest. So the priest is the leader of the spiritual army. Of course, he was also a prophet. He was also an anointed judge. King David, very interesting figure. He filled all three offices in certain ways. Uh, he was the one to give new birth to the order of Melchizedek with the tabernacle of David. Anyway, we're going to take a look at these in more depth, but first we just take a look at Shemuel. So his in Shemuel Aleph or first Samuel chapter one and verse 11, his mother Hannah made a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So she's talking about the things that a Nazarite would do. She's making that promise for her child. So Shemuel, very interesting, very important figure. We talk about him more in our series on the Tabernacle of David. But now we're going to come to Shoftim, or Judges, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. We're going to come to Shimshon, or Samson. So like we always do, Yahweh makes things good and we turn away from him. We figure we got our own, our own, <laughs> our own blessings from our own power and strength. We don't need to obey Yahweh. We can just say we're keeping the Torah. We can read it and not do it. Everything's good. Oh no, Yahweh doesn't like that. So again, our forefathers did evil in the sight of Yahweh. What did Yahweh do? Kick us out of the garden, delivers us into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Verse 2, now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. We're not going to be able to do the whole story here. Verse 3, and the messenger of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, 
please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink. That's Nazarite language and not to eat anything unclean. That's not specifically Nazarite language. That's just a general commandment in Israel, Leviticus 11, uh, eat clean. You're going to be in service to Yahweh. You need to eat clean. You need to obey all his commandments. You need to be hearing his voice, doing what he says to do, including all the record of what he said previously in his written commandments. Verse 5, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, Nazarite language, for the child shall be a Nazarite to Elohim from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so this uh, was focusing on that. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, and that's important language. We're going to make a lot of negative comments about Shimshon. We need to remember that this was from Yahweh. So, now, chapter 14, verse 1, Shimshon went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. And his father and mother said to him, Are you crazy? What? Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Shimshon said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. So that's a bad choice. There's, there's, so make that point. Verse 4, But his father and mother did not know that it was of Yahweh, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines through Shimshon and his service. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Verse 5, So Shimshon went down to Timnah, with his father and mother, and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Okay, now, why is a Nazarite going to vineyards? <clears throat> now, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. Verse, so we drop down to verse 9. He took some of the honey, so he kills a lion, he kills the lion, and then comes back later, and there's bees and honey inside the carcass. Verse 9. So he took some of the honey in his hands and went along eating the honey. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. He's not supposed to be touching dead things. That's you set apart to Yahweh. Verse 10. Now, but this is sort of a, if it's a living off the land situation, that's different. Yohanan Hamabil or John the Baptist lived off the land. We talk about that in other studies. Verse 10, so his father went down to the woman, and Shimshon gave a feast there. It, um, very often alcohol was involved. We don't know if Shimshon drank or didn't drink or just offered drink. We don't know. But Shimshon gave a feast there for the uncircumcised Philistines, for young men used to do so. We drop down to verse 19. Then the spirit of Yahweh came upon Shimshon mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, so dead bodies, sudden death, took their apparel, stripping the carcasses, and gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house. So chapter 15 and verse 7, Shimshon said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Etam. So again, he's in contact with a lot of death, a lot of, car, a lot of people dying suddenly here. And that's not something a Nazarite is supposed to do. So verse 15. 1515, he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Okay, so it's a fresh jawbone, that's a carcass. He killed a thousand men. Verse 16, then Shimshon said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Um, <laughs> so he's breaking the Nazarite vow left and right. 
Now, he didn't choose the vow, but he's under the vow. Okay, chapter 16 and verse 1. Now, Shimshon went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. Okay, that's not something we're supposed to do. Verse 4. After that, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And most of us know the story. Delilah was, Delilah was bad news. Verse 17, she harassed him, hounded him, tried to get him to tell her how he could be bound. And then he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to Elohim from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So, of course, what does she do? Verse 19, then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him because he broke the vow. So verse 30, uh, Shimshon is captured. His hair begins to regrow. Then Shimshon said, let me, chapter 16, verse 30, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. So again, we need to remember that Yahweh was using Shimshon for an opportunity to move against the Philistines and he operated primarily, in this case, in the kingship role. Now, we're going to get into the rabbinic literature. So this is from Wikipedia, just summarizing things. So this is Wikipedia, Nazarite 4, well, hold on a minute, Nazarite 4A. I'm not sure. Okay, and uh, Maybe not Nazarite 4A, but it's the Wikipedia entry on Nazarites. That's a typo there. So in the Mishnah, there's a section that says, in the rabbinic literature, the Mishnaic laws. Okay, and then they diverge from what Yahweh says. So he's talking about the Orthodox Halakha, which is the, the way the Orthodox Jews parse Scripture, the Jewish, the Torah law, the Talmudic Torah law, has a rich tradition on the laws of the Nazarite. Now, to be respectful, basically that means that Livy makes a bunch of stuff up because in addition to the biblical text on number six, one through 21, the laws are, it says, explained in detail in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And really what's happened, we're going to see the laws are replaced in detail. Okay. There's a substitution going on. It's a different religion. It's not the, it's not what Yahweh says to do. There'd be a swap. Okay, so we look it up. It's in the Mishnah and the Talmud, Tractate Nazir. These laws were later codified by Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah. Okay, so, and then you, I think that's still Wikipedia. And then under vows, it says, in general, there are two types of Nazarites. Those who take a vow for a set time, and you can choose 30 days, a year, whatever, and permanent Nazarites. Okay, that's a rabbinic tradition. The so-called permanent Nazarite has no source in the Bible, but is known through tradition. Now, there's an old saying that where scripture is silent, we should be also. So what Yahweh says about this, or King Solomon, so Mishlei or Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found to be a liar. Okay, now, in love, speaking this to our brothers, uh, we can't afford to be replacing Yahweh's word with our own words. He doesn't, he doesn't accept it. Okay, so let's see what happens on Brother Judah's end of things. Now, this is the Safaria website, Tractate Nazir 4A. Okay, that's where the 4A came from on Wikipedia. So this first quote is from the Mishnah. Again, the Mishnah was done uh, just for Christians. So the rabbis have always had their, well, I don't know about always, but for a very long time, they've had their writings. They had the Zugo pairs starting in the days of the Greek occupation, the Macedonian occupation. And then it's a complicated history. We'll have to get into it more later. But they've had various books or scrolls that they've kept with them. 
and then Rabbi Judah Hanasi, around the year 220 CE, he redacted or edited or censored to give us what we have today in the Talmud. But the primary document of the Talmud is called the Mishnah, and then you have the Gemara, which is commentary. So now in the Mishnah, which I'm not 100% clear, but it's supposed to have the highest status in the Talmud, it says, what is the difference between a permanent Nazarite and a Nazarite like Shimshon, both of whom remain Nazarites forever? You know, this doesn't exist in, in Yahweh's word. It says, in the case of a permanent Nazarite, if his hair grows too heavy for him, he lightens it by cutting some hair with a razor. Okay, and then he brings three animals as a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a peace offering, like one who completes his term of Nazarite ship. Uh, well, I'll back up. And, I mean, to me, this is like, this is just a stop you right in your tracks. Okay. So if you have a permanent Nazarite, which is not mentioned in Tanakh, then you can go ahead and cut your hair once a year, just as long as you make an offering. Okay. It doesn't say that in Yahweh's word. This is, that's a substitution for Yahweh's word. That's a change to Yahweh's word. Okay. Continuing on. Now come to Nazir 4b, it's the backside of page 4. The Gemara clarifies a halakha taught in the Mishnah. It asks a very good question. It says, where is the concept of a permanent Nazarite written? Where does this come from? Okay, this is the loyal opposition. Okay, so when you read the Talmud, uh, you read the Mishnah, which is the core document, and you'll have the Gemara, which will discuss the Mishnah, but they'll never really, I mean, sometimes they'll disagree with it a little bit, but it'll always reconcile back to the Mishnah because the Mishnah is considered to be holy. The whole thing is considered to be holy. I'm not an expert on it. I'm learning, but that's how they do it. And it says that the Gemara clarifies a halakha taught in the Mishnah. So Gomorrah comments on the Mishnah. It says, where's the concept of a permanent Nazarite written? Well, as it's taught in a Baraita in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, I would imagine, I don't know that, but it's taught in a Baraita. A Baraita is the Talmud. It says, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, or Judah the Prince, okay, the circa 220 CE says, Avshalom was a permanent Nazarite. As it is stated, and it came to pass at the end of 40 years, we'll talk about that, that Avshalom said to the king, I pray you, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to Yahweh in Hebron. And he's referring to 2 Samuel 15 and verse 7. Take a look. It says, now it came to pass after 40 years that Avshalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to Yahweh. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Geshur. Okay, so there's, there's uh, some small discussion we'll make here. In Syria saying, if Yahweh indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve Yahweh. So Geshur was about four years prior. And let's see if we got that in there. So verse 37, 2 Samuel, Shemuel Bet, chapter 13, verse 37 says, Avshalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. So Avshalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. So uh, there's some discussion. Either way, it doesn't really matter uh, whether he was there, whether he took the vow four years prior or 40 years prior. But Rav... Judah Hanasi, Judah the prince, said, and he cut his hair once every 12 months, as it is stated, and when he pulled his head, now it was at every year's end that he pulled it because the hair was heavy on him. He cites the reference. So he's citing references. He just, you reach a different conclusion than what Yahweh says. So we come here to Shemuel Bet 1426. And when Av Shalom cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year he cut it because it was heavy on him. 
When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels, according to the king's standard. And then we make different things, whether you think it's 40 years or four years, but we'll keep running with this. The problem we have here, brothers, and I say this in love, if you're going to replace Yahweh's word, how is that different than the serpent? And for Ephraim, if you're going to replace Yahweh's word by doing nothing, how is that different than giving in to the serpent? Okay, both houses are supposed to come together. The only thing we can come together on is Yahweh's word. That's what he tells us again and again. I want you to hear my voice. I want you to do what I tell you to do, including all of the prior of the written commandments. And if we're not going to do that, then how do we call ourselves servants of the Most High? How do we call ourselves that in a way that's going to stand up when we go to stand before the throne in the day of judgment? And that's what people need to be thinking of. Not your standing in the community, not rumors flying around, not what people think of you. Okay, and that's a Nazarite attitude. You're not going to worry about what people think of you. You're not getting all clean shaven and dressing up and all this kind of stuff to build an artificial reality. Okay, you're just going to be who Yahweh made you. You're going to pay attention to Yahweh and that's it. So, now we come to our Brit Hadashah portion, and I'm going to take a short break. And uh, if you're in a group, maybe it's a good time for discussion. Okay, we have way too much material to cover here. Uh, we could camp on this subject and go on for quite some time. If you'd like to know more, okay, you have uh, all Sabbath, you have all week. If you'd like to know more, recommend the study Yeshua the celibate Nazarite. There's a lot of detail in there we can't get into here. Also, if you want to know even more, abstinence, celibacy, and Nazarites. You can just type Nazarites up in the in the search bar, but this one is in covenant relationships. Let's come here to the renewed covenant. We're going to dive right in. We get a lot of information. Luca or Luke chapter 1, verse 13. The messenger said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elisheva will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yohanan, as in Yohanan Hamakbil, or John the Immerser. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of Yahweh, and shall neither drink wine nor strong drink, as Nazarite language. He will also be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, or the set-apart spirit, even from his mother's womb. That's all Nazarite language. It's a dedication to Yahweh. That's what the Nazarite vow is. <clears throat> and we see this, it crops up, and we should cover this. So anytime you see someone with a lot of hair who's dedicating themselves to Yahweh, it's not for certain there's a Nazarite vow, but perhaps people like Moshe, uh, Eliyahu, uh, El Elisha, these kinds of things, you see people with hair, and a dedication and a vow, they're serving in a prophetic role. So the, those things all go together. And we also see it in Bereshit or Genesis 49 and verse 26. It says, the, Israel says, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. And they shall be on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the head of him, who was separated from his brothers. And that's when he was, that's when Levi and Judah sold us into Egypt. So the word separated there is the same root, Nazir. <clears throat> so you see this crop up all over the place. So in Luke chapter 15, parable of the prodigal son, we saw this in Parashah Bahukotai, verse 11. Then he said, a certain Yeshua is giving a parable and he's talking about how a certain man, Yahweh, had two sons, which is Judah and Ephraim. And the young, Judah and Joseph, but Joseph's son, Ephraim. Verse 12, and the younger of them said to his father, meaning Yahweh, Father, please give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them, he divided to them his livelihood and, his, and the split between the southern house and the northern house. 
verse 13. And not many days after, the young the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. We're talking about the Assyrian diaspora. It wasn't long after the split that we went into captivity in Assyria. And we've been gone for something like 77% of Israel's history. So not long after, it says, uh, but not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and traveled into the Assyrian diaspora and lost, we lost everything. We became total pagans. We're worshiping sticks and rocks and trees and what you got. Okay, so come to verse 22. But the father Yahweh said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Joseph's robe, put a signet ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So this is a, call it a Nachmanides marker. It's a Nachmanides pattern. It's a repeat. So Joseph was sent into the dispersion. Ephraim was sent into the dispersion. So now, after all these years, 10% of us are coming back. And brothers and sisters, it is, say this to the house of Ephraim, it is so very important to leave the house of Esau behind. It is so very important to rid yourself of any red horse doctrine. So you've just got to get out of the mystery Babylonian Greco-Roman church mindset. We've got to get into the Beit Mikra, the assembly mindset. There's, there's no substitute for this. So, Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 1 talks about the 90% of us, they're not going to make it. Because why? Because they don't dedicate themselves to Yahweh. They won't let themselves be truly filled with His Spirit. Yahweh says, woe to the crown of pride. We're talking about Ephraim. There's so much pride. You know, what do you call it when someone reads Yahweh's word and knows what to do and they just don't want to do it? They don't think they need to. You know, because to him who knows to do good but does not, to him it is sin. So, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, which is the vast majority of people watching this video. Because you're, you're taking it in, but you're not giving Yahweh his due. You're not submitting to Yahweh's voice. You're not submitting to his written words. That's called rebellion. He says, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. And take a look at Christendom, especially in the United States today, that's what you see. You see a fading flower at the head of the verdant valleys, and they've just got this spiritual thing. It's like, I don't have to do the whole Torah. I don't have to do the whole Tanakh. I don't have to even keep the whole Brit Hadashah. I just call myself a disciple and I'm good. So now we come to Yohanan or John chapter two, and that should read, there's a typo there, that should read verses one through three, originally one through four. <clears throat> but it says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galil, or Galilee, and the mother of Yeshua was there. Now, both Yeshua and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, Yeshua's mother said to him, they have no wine. <clears throat> Here's verse, should be read verse four up top. Yeshua said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? What do we have to do together? How are we supposed to serve Elohim together in this matter? My hour to separate my Nazarite vow has not yet come. And in the study, we talk about how Yeshua had a Nazarite vow up until he began his ministry, and he may have cut it, cut the time short uh, because of this situation, because it was the perform the first of his miracles. And then shortly after in the study, we see him go up to Jerusalem to separate his vow, we believe. And then he didn't have a vow while dealing and talking and living amongst the people. 
so that he could minister to them and minister to those who are lost. So he separated his Nazarite vow in order to perform his ministry, and then he went back to a separated state right before he was sacrificed. So Luke chapter 22 and verse 17, it says, And taking the cup, giving thanks, Yeshua said, Take this cup and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I shall certainly not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the reign of Elohim comes. And we talked before, <clears throat> not sure if it was last week or but recently, we talked about the difference between the reign of Elohim and the kingdom of Elohim. The kingdom of Elohim is a spiritual kingdom, but the time will come when we're, it will manifest here on earth. So that's what they're talking about in Acts chapter 1. Master, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel, meaning to Ephraim? Ephraim. So here he's saying, I shall certainly not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the reign of Elohim comes. Why? It's because he's working. It's a very Nazarite thing to do. Now, we talked about this early on in the section on Nazarites in the Torah portion. We come to Acts 18 and verse 18, and this is where so many Christians, their heads just melt or explode, one or the other. So verse 18, having remained many days more, having taken leave of the brothers, Shaliach Shaul, the apostle Paul, sailed to Syria, because having shaved his head, for he had taken a vow. Again, this is Nazarite language. There's only one vow in scripture where you shave your head at the completion. That's the Nazarite vow. And then, okay, so he separated his Nazarite vow. What would he do? Well, the next thing he would do would be go up to the temple. He'd go up to Jerusalem. And that's what we see him doing. So Maase, chapter 21, in verse 23, he has a very important meeting or confrontation with Shaliach Yaakov, Yaakov HaTzadik. He was the Nasi or the prince, or the, you could say president, but he was the prince of the Nazarene Beit Din. So, and Peter, Kepha, talks about this in Second Kepha. He talks about how uh, there were people in the first century who misunderstood and twisted Shaul's writings to say things that they didn't. You know, in other words, they misunderstood Shaul. Well, who is that? That's Christendom. That's Asaph. So, uh, and then even in Yeshua's time, Mark 9 and verse 38, even in Yeshua's time, you had people who were following Yeshua, who thought they were obeying Yeshua, but they weren't obeying his Jude 3 halacha. And they're not following Yeshua because to follow Yeshua means you obey his halacha. If he's your one and only rabbi, you have to walk, you have to imitate him. So, and so many Ephraimites, it's just like, no, that's just a cultural thing from the first century. We don't have to do that. Okay, well, if that's how you feel, if that's how you believe, you are in the house of Asaph. You are still tainted pink. And we need to separate ourselves from that. It's of the utmost importance that we separate ourselves from Esau and Esau's walk. And the way we graft back into the Jewish root is by imitating our rabbi, our one and only rabbi. That's how, that's how we're supposed to do it. Okay, so we come now, he's, he's going up to Jerusalem. He separated his vow. He's coming up to Jerusalem. He gets there. It's Acts, Maase, 21 and verse 23. And this is Nasi Yaakov. He's saying, now, therefore, do what we tell you. There's a whole bunch of confusion. We talk about this in the Nazarene Israel study. There's a whole bunch of confusion about who you are, what you're teaching, what you believe really. Okay, so clear all that confusion up. Now do what we tell you to do. We've got four other men besides yourself who have also taken a vow. There'd be five Nazarites, including Shaul. Verse 24, take them and be purified with them, and you pay their expenses <clears throat> so that they may also shave their heads. And then all may know that those things of which they were informed or misinformed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also 
walk orderly, meaning you're following Yeshua's Jude 3 halacha, and you're keeping the Torah, meaning the written Torah, the Torah Moshe. Now, <clears throat> if ever there was a time when Shaul could have said, no, no, I really mean it. All those Christian interpretations are true. The law was really nailed to the cross. It's all done. We're doing something else now. It's only grace, greasy grace. You know, that's all it is anymore. This would have been the time to do that. But he didn't do that. It's important for anyone in Ephraim, anyone in Christendom, to understand he didn't do that. Okay, verse 24. Take these men, you be purified along with them, and you pay their expenses so that they may also shave their heads. Okay, so that's five Nazarites. That's three animals per Nazarite. That's 15 animals. Five of those animals are sacrifices for sin. And this is after Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, and if he, he says to do this, you pay their expenses. That he's not just going to throw money out in the street. Okay, he's not going to throw away money on something that's not important. Okay, Jews are very smart with money. They're very wise. They're very conscious about money. They're not going to give money to something they don't believe in. Okay, and so he's going to pay for five animal sacrifices for sin. He's going to pay fifteen animal sacrifices to show that. Every, to show everyone that the things that they were informed of concerning him, same things you learn in the church, you know, Paul said, and then therefore now you can ignore Yahweh, you can ignore Yeshua because Paul said, okay, everyone's supposed to read this chapter and be informed concerning all those false rumors that they are nothing, but that Shaul also himself also walked orderly according to Yeshua's Jude 3 halacha and kept the written Torah of Moshe. It's right there. But because most of Ephraim is still in the house of Esau, most of Ephraim is still taking Esau's interpretation on this thing. And brothers and sisters, if you don't leave the house of Esau, you won't come home. I don't know how much simpler we can make it. So, now, there's a lot of people that get all excited about the Nazarite vow. I counsel everyone what King Solomon said in Kohelet or Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. He says, if you're going to, and people get so excited, you know, especially you have uh, youngsters, they get all excited. If you're going to make the vow, I recommend give it a limited time first. You don't know what you're getting into, especially if you're still in school. Okay, it's, it will affect everything. It's totally worth it. But don't take the vow unless you hear Elohim say. Okay, that's the very first fundament and principle. We're no longer making our own decisions here. We're praying, asking him to help us hear his voice and obey his voice, including everything written in the Tanakh, and, of course, the Brit Hadashah. And if we're not doing that, then we're really putting the cart in front of the horse. When it doesn't make sense. So, listen for what you do. If you make a vow to Elohim, don't delay to pay it. For Elohim has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vowed, because it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. And I've seen so many people, they take the Nazarite vow and then they can't maintain it. They take it for life. They can't, they can't do it. Okay. Better not to vow than vow and not pay. But brothers and sisters, our boss, Yahweh Elohim says, Judah and Joseph will come back together. We can do it the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. We can avoid going back to the Tanakh, I'm talking both houses, or we can play our respective games. We can remain in the Talmud, we can read things and not do them. 
Okay, but for this to be fulfilled, Ephraim has to go back to the Tanakh. Ephraim has to actually do what's written in the Brit Hadashah. And there's a lot of people playing silly games with their eternal salvation on this. Bo both houses. Both houses. We need to stop and remember what it's going to be like to stand in front of that throne in that day. And he's going to ask us, did, I don't know what he's going to say, but did you read my book? Did you do what I said to do? Were you listening for me? Did you dedicate your life for listening to me? Ephraim, <laughs> did, you, did you read Yeshua's words? Both houses need Yeshua. Did, did we do that or did we not do that? What are we doing here? Are you serving me or are you serving yourselves? Okay. How are we going to come together, brothers? Amos 3 and verse 3. We can't walk together unless we are agreed. What can we agree on? We both believe Tanakh. The Tanakh commands hearing and obeying his voice. That's what we need to focus on. That's the example that a Nazarite gives. So thank you for our presentation on the Nazarite. Thank you for watching and tuning in for our presentation on the Nazarite vow. May Yahweh please give you a good day of study. Judah doesn't study on Shabbat. They study all week, so they need a break. Much of Ephraim, they don't have time to study except on Shabbat. Uh, if you're in that category, there's many things on the website to check out. Just type in Nazarite on the search bar. Dedicate the day to Elohim. Shabbat Shalom.